on July 18th. We are going to be recording the meeting and it will be available afterwards for folks to look at if you weren't able to attend the meeting or if you want to share it or if there's anything you want to go back and make sure that you got just right. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, let's jump right into it. If you have any questions, of course, you're always welcome to put it into the chat or you can wait until the end and then we'll hopefully have ample time to answer questions then as well. But you're always welcome to put it in the chat or raise your little hand and uh, we'll be sure to try to call on you. Otherwise, please make sure that you are muted and uh, we will jump right in. Of course, we like to always acknowledge our indigenous communities in the state of Colorado, especially as a state person with the government. I um, am deeply committed to um, re re reparational and restorative practices with our indigenous communities and native populations and supporting them continuously because they are still here and vibrant and thriving as a community. And we encourage our eligible entities to think about how you do that as well. And we are gonna jump right in with a presentation in the spirit of linkages, which we love to talk about in CSBG. And we have a presenter today, Maria. Thank you so much, Maria, for joining us today. And Maria is gonna share a presentation briefly. And um, then we will continue with the CCAA and DOLA talking points as well. So Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Maria Hobbs. I am the LEAP program lead, and I am here to talk about LEAP. So if you haven't heard about LEAP before, it is the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. And this program is designed to assist low income households pay part of their winter heating expenses. So when we say part of their winter heating expenses, we are a seasonal program that runs from November 1st through April 30th. And the goal is to only pay a portion of heating costs. So a lot of time customers expect us to pay their full electric or utility bill, and that's not the case. Their benefit is based off of their previous winter heating usage. And so sometimes with clients, when they have a natural gas or a propane furnace, they also expect their electricity to be paid. Unfortunately, we will not assist with the electric bill if they do not have all electric heat. So sometimes customers do get that confused. Why didn't you pay this huge electric bill? That's because they use natural gas or propane and that's the bill we will assist with. Um, we can assist both owners and renters. So if there is a renter whose heat is included in their rent, we will give them a benefit for that amount. Mm. And then also households can only be approved one time per season. So if they apply in the beginning of November, they can't come back in March or April and apply again to receive an additional benefit. And then just to give you a little background about LEAP, it is a program that started back in the 80s and it is a federally funded program. And that means too, every state, um, tribe and territory has some version of this program. Colorado is a designated cold state, which is why we focus on heating. Other states like Nevada, Arizona, they're hot states, so they'll have a cooling program. And then we do receive from the feds about over 50 million in a block grant, which allows us a little bit more flexibility on how we determine how to run the program in Colorado. So the feds really give us a little bit of leeway on designing this program. So we are state supervised. So I am part of a team of five who come up with the rules and we provide the applications as well as the system for our counties and contractor to determine eligibility in. We have 
nine self-administered counties, which means they process the LEAP applications in-house at their county. And then we have Goodwill of Colorado who administers for 55 of the counties. So if you are one of the counties in the dark blue, those applications will be sent to Colorado Springs to Goodwill to be processed. So if you do come across an envelope that says Colorado Springs and maybe you're in Larimer County, that is the correct envelope to use. Now, even though they are contracted with Goodwill to process LEAP applications, clients can still go into those Department of Human Services and pick up an application or get assistance with filling out that application. They'll just forward those applications on to Goodwill. So again, our program starts November 1st and ends April 30th. So this is the time frame for customers to submit their LEAP application. Um, we do kind of help our clients who were on LEAP the previous season or anyone who applied but wasn't approved because they didn't turn in verification. We send them a blank LEAP application at the end of September. And we want them to actually fill out that application and submit it before November 1st. That way it gives the eligibility staff kind of a leg up before the general public starts getting applications in. So if you do have a customer who says, I just got a LEAP application in the mail in October, tell them to complete it and send it in. That way we can get a jump start and we're not bombarded with a whole bunch of applications in November. So there are multiple ways for customers to apply for LEAP. We have this great HEAT Help line. It's one 866 heat help And if you probably noticed, that's too many letters for numbers for a phone call. By the time you hit L, it's automatically dialing, okay? Um, this number is great. It's a 24-7 number. It does run all year round. We do share it with Energy Outreach Colorado. Um, so clients can call this number and request an application. They will go ahead and mail an application to a client. They'll also provide the contact information for their county or for goodwill to get that application sent in. They can also find out the status of their application once the season starts. So Heat Help does have access to our system and they can go in and say, yep, they've received your application. It's been assigned to a technician or yep, they got it. They just need additional information to finish processing and let them know that it's been approved. The other great thing about Heat Help is for the clients who have a barrier to applying, they're homebound or they don't have computer access or they are unable to read or write, they can call Heat Help and apply over the phone. So they do have dedicated agents who will go through the entire application with the customer, get those answered, and then forward it on to whoever is processing for that county. And then of course, the local Department of Human Services, we do mail all of the counties, whether they're self-administered or goodwill administered, blank LEAP applications to have in their lobby, do outreach with, um, so they should have some in their office. So customers can go into their local Department of Human Services, pick up an application as well as submit it there as well. And then starting November 1st on our website at the colorado.gov slash CDHS slash LEAP, clients can download a LEAP application. It's a PDF form that they can fill out and they can email it or mail that application in. On our website, we do have a list of mailing addresses and emails for the various counties and Goodwill. So they can do that starting November 1st. And then also November 1st is the peak application. Um, so clients can go on to PEAK and LEAP will be one of the programs available to apply for. Um, as you know, with PEAK, 
You can apply for multiple programs at one time. It can be a little lengthy when you apply for multiple programs, um, but you can just select LEAP and apply there. The other thing that's a little bit different for LEAP on PEAK is we don't talk back and forth with PEAK. Mm -hmm. So when a client is applying for LEAP, at that time is the best time to upload documents, verification that they need for their application because they can't go back later and submit it for leak. If they mm -hmm. do go back and log into their peak account and try to upload documents for leap, leap is not going to see it, okay? We don't have access to EDMS, so we can't see the documents if they get uploaded. And then the eligibility criteria for LEAP, one is vulnerability and that's being responsible for home heating costs. So someone has to be responsible for paying that heating bill to be eligible. And that's when we need to, we verify it with heating bills. So if they get an Excel statement, we can use that, a propane receipt if they get propane or if their heat's included in their rent, just a rent receipt yeah, stating that heat is included in their rent or a current lease that says heat is included. The second one is citizenship and residency. So there must at least be one person in the household who is lawfully present. And so the only verification we need are for those household members who were born outside of the US they do have to provide documentation that they are lawfully present in the US to be considered eligible in that household. And so a lot of scenarios that we come across is we might have a three person household where there's two adults who are not lawfully present, but one child who was born in the US, they're a US citizen, so that child is eligible instead of counting that as a household of three, we will count it as a household of one. So they could still be eligible as long as they meet the income guidelines for a household of one. And then the third criteria is they do have to be income eligible. And our income guidelines are set at 60% of the state median income. And so we do need a month worth of income when they submit their LEAP application. And so we can use pay stubs or documentation from an employer stating how much they made in those four weeks prior to application. And then I just got this today. So this is fresh off the presses. This is our updated income guidelines. It hasn't been updated on our website. I'll do that tonight. Um, but they do change every month, not every month, every year. They change every year. Um, so these are for next season. And it will be updated on our website and as well as our brochures and our LEAP applications. And then our minimum and maximum benefit. Our minimum benefit is $200 and the maximum benefit is a thousand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times our households who are in subsidized housing or their heat included in their rent, they're about the lower end around $200. And then our folks who are all electric heat or use propane are towards the higher end of the benefit. Um, you might hear customers say they're getting two LEAP payments. It's still one benefit just before February. If they're getting more than the minimum, we'll split that payment into two equal payments. They'll get the first payment the month that they were approved, and then all second payments will come out in February. So sometimes that can confuse customers. They think, especially if they got approved in January, they get a payment in January, and then February, they think it's a monthly benefit. It is not. And then just a couple of um, highlights from this 
past season that just ended, um, we issued $49 million in benefits. Um, the average payment was $591.12, and we were able to assist 84,096 households. And we had a 15% increase in total applications. So we are exhausted after last season. And we're gearing up to do a repeat next year. So please get the word out. We want to assist more and more households. Okay, I went 23 minutes. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, Josiah. Maria, thank you so much for the wonderful information and for your time and bringing this information to our network. Uh, off of your last point, uh, your increase last year and how much work you all did and you're looking forward to next season. Are there any geographical and or uh, target populations that your office is looking to increase enrollment in the LEAP program? Just off the top of your head, just our network uh, might know if they're in those areas to, to really, um, you know, look for LEAP opportunities with their customers? Um, definitely the rural areas. Um, it's a little bit harder because the DHS offices are so far apart. People are a lot further away and there might just be one office. Um, and then sometimes in the middle of winter, they can't get into town. You know, there's issues. Definitely the rural areas trying to get the word out before winter really sets in and then they're homebound. Thank you. We have a lot of agencies covering the rural areas. Thank you. Looks like we have a question in the chat from Courtney. Has LEAP ever considered cooling assistance? Their community needs assessment this year had this pop up several times, a couple times. Yes, we are trying to get cooling. Um, it's kind of been a battle because with the funding we get, it's really not enough. Um, it's really the admin costs. So because we're seasonal, a lot of the eligibility workers are off during the summer. So for us to institute a cooling program, we have to figure out how we're able to pay those folks to stay on year round. So we are trying to implement a cooling program. I did see a couple of people, I think it's um, down in Pueblo, that you guys are hitting 100 degrees. Oof, it's hot. And it does cause, it is a health issue. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maria. We really appreciate you joining us today, as well as the super impactful work that you're doing. And um, of course, we're always happy to spread the word about other services and agencies that our clients can tap into in order to support um, you know, themselves and their experiences. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time today. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Alrighty, so we are going to press on with the Colorado Community Action Association's presentation now. Thanks, Josiah. Thanks, Alex, and good afternoon, everyone. Real excited to be with you, and thank you for your time. Uh, we got a big list of items we're going to go through fairly quickly, and we're going to start it off with a staff and board update from the CCAA. Very excited to welcome on uh, full-time staff member Stephen Panchenko. Uh, he's going to be uh, or is our community engagement and data specialist and Stephen's working hard on our affordable connectivity program that we're launching, as well as our long standing volunteer income tax assistance program so excited to welcome Stephen aboard also have our uh, University of Colorado Boulder Pi intern Melissa Ramirez working with us through this summer real excited to have M Melissa on board many of you probably uh, received communications that Melissa have has crafted for us also would like to welcome a brand new position with us a postgraduate intern uh, Sawyer Mack is joining us for, after graduating from the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver and real excited to have Sawyer involved in our communications and strategies 
And uh, just a big uh, um, welcome to everybody in the network to consider applying to join the CCAA Board of Directors. We're recruiting right now for eligible entity program managers and administrators to apply to join the CCA Board. You can reach out to us um, over at the CCA with further information. And real quickly, the CCA board is doing a strategic plan this year. We've kicked it off the past couple months. Um, our consultant, Kavi Consultants, are doing interviews and focus groups with some key stakeholders. Many of you have been communicated with and have been or are being interviewed for us. We really appreciate your time and engagement around that. We're also working on a survey that you all will get and we'll ask you to fill out and provide us uh, and our board some feedback on direction and vision and needs throughout our communities. So really appreciate all of you all being engaged as well as helping us to engage uh, subrecipients that you have relationships with, other key stakeholders and partners in your communities that are uh, crucial in, in everything that goes on to help folks um, uh, achieve stability and or economic security locally, as well as uh, local um, community members, and of course, those that have experienced or are experiencing poverty. So please do help us to get that survey out uh, far and wide when we release that over the coming month. And we will be wrapping up our strategic planning uh, around the end of the year. We're going to be doing an in-person retreat uh, September 14th, somewhere in Denver, likely, uh, followed by uh, the next morning, the Friday, September 15th, our annual board of directors meeting. Uh, all will be welcome. So we'll be uh, looking forward to that as well. And with that, I'm going to send it over to Jessica to introduce our FCC Affordable Connectivity Program. Thank you, Josiah. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. I appreciate your time. Um, just really quickly want to talk about the Affordable Connectivity Program Outreach Grant that we received as of June 15th. Um, we got right around $200,000 um, to conduct outreach and increase enrollment across the state of Colorado. Um, we participated on the, the tail end of the ACP Action Week after we received notification of our awards. So you might have seen some social media posts and online presence um, through our accounts and information there. We are gonna be beginning some outreach events in person. So part of our application plan was um, that we're intending to be present in at least 19 in-person events as they're going on, particularly um, this summer and into the fall before the weather gets a little bit crazy. Um, and our goal is to connect with 4,000 families or households to get them connected with ACP. So um, some of the events that we're going to be starting off with are actually a couple county fairs. Um, we're going to be in Logan County at the county fair in August and then follow that up in Larimer County at the fair there the second week in August. So if you're around that area, come out and see us and talk to us. Um, we will have people right there at the booth enrolling people in person or giving out information for how we can enroll them um, at a time that might be more convenient or work better for them. So excited about all of that. And then as um, the weather starts to cool down and travel is a little bit less reliable, um, we're really gonna be leaning on some of our partners to share space with them and come in for the day and talk to their customers about how we can get them connected with ACP and also share some vital resources as well. Um, our target areas are going to be um, ones that show the greatest discrepancy between the number of projected eligible households that qualify for ACP versus the number that are actually enrolled. Um, those are our green sites that we're targeting, and then we kind of have a plan of action from there. So really excited about the impact that we'll be able to make. Um, I talked about the spreadsheet. We're going to be tracking a lot of data, especially at our in-person events, and have um, are in the process of setting up our website to be able to get some statistics and draw some analysis from the outreach that we're doing on our website and also on our social media accounts. So we'll flip gears to membership now, unless anybody has questions. I was just going to say, make a note, uh, Jessica, again, what is the monthly stipend that the uh, enrolled families receive? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's um, $30 is for the connection of the internet service. And then in addition to that, people that qualify and are eligible for the program have the ability to get up to $100 towards a device, whether that's a laptop 
or a tablet um, because we recognize that it's not just the need for the actual connection, but you have to have a device in order to do the, the work or the, the school or whatever it is that you wanna do online, right? Um, and that's kind of one of the beautiful pieces about the, um, thinking about public library as a partnership because we can get people connected, we can help them get their equipment, um, but we don't necessarily have the um, extra skills and support they need for how to run their machines or their software. And so to be able to have somebody come into the library, work with them to get connected, get the tools they need, and get the education is going to set them on their way for success. So we're really excited about that. All right, then flipping gears a little bit here, quickly talking about our membership period. Um, we have our membership period opened as of July 1st. It runs through June 30th. If you are in the middle of a current membership with us, we do have one and two year membership agreements. Um, you probably received an email from me saying that you are current with your dues and still have another year to go. Um, but if you are were a current member um, and we need to renew your membership, um, an email went out about that last week. And then we sent out information about our general um, membership and what that looks like um, to our list here this week as well. We also have this information available on our website, but we certainly encourage everyone to join us as a member here um, with CCAA. The, some of the benefits real quickly here include just getting early notification um, about trainings and discounts on those training opportunities. You also receive pri prioritization when it comes to CCAA scholarships that are offered for you to attend some of those professional development opportunities. Um, additional information from our national partners, CAP law, organizations like that. Um, and of course, just being a part of support, supporting that statewide voice um, in Colorado around CSBG and community action. So if you have questions, please reach out, check out our website, let us know. Um, we're excited to have you as our members. Liz, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jessica, I appreciate that. Um, so our regional forums have been wonderful so far. We have hosted six regional forums, um, and this week we have, uh, well, this week will be our sixth one. So we have hosted five. Um, this week's will be in Frisco. Uh, we have four more remaining after that. Uh, so there are, there still is time to register for those. And um, we are also working on, on a virtual forum that um, will be hosted after our Castle Rock forum. Um, and that date has to be determined. These are all day forums. Um, so far we've received some really great feedback on those from our attendees. Um, if you've attended a forum and you haven't had an opportunity to fill out your evaluation survey, um, we really, really ask that you take some time to do that for us um, because we are reading each and every one of those. Um, and we are taking to heart what is being said. We are making tweaks here and there. Um, and we are making these the best that we can for each one of the attendees. So please, please take an opportunity uh, to fill out those evaluation surveys. Um, so if your schedule allows you to, please uh, take some time and spend a day with us to go um, through these. We touch on data, community needs assessment, theory of change. And we also have a great section that goes on, on and about social return on investment. So I really encourage you to attend one of those. You can register um, on our website. There's a link um, and there's no cost to register and attend the forum and lunch is provided for these. Uh, I think that is all on that one. And so we are reaching the end of the conference season. Um, we've had wonderful conferences so far in Austin um, and also Las Vegas. The last one um, is going to be the National Community Action Partnership it will be held in Atlanta, August 23rd through the 25th. Uh, the annual convention is designed to provide community action agency professionals and board members with the latest policy and programmatic updates, as well as management and governance tools. Uh, CCAA staff and board members um, We'll be attending that so you'll get an opportunity to spend some time with some of us. If you decide to attend, we also have scholarship opportunities to attend that particular conference. Um, so please reach out to us if you're interested in attending one of those. We also have um, the National Community Action Partnership is hosting the data 
CONCON or the data convening, which is designed, designed to bring together data experts from across community action um, to take a deep dive into some complex issues around data and community action agencies when it comes to collecting, analyzing, and using that data for decision making. Um, and that is going to be limited to three uh, registrations per agency. Um, but this is kind of one of the first of its kind. We're really excited for this to be hosting this here. Um, it's going to be at the Curtis in downtown Denver. Um, so if you have an opportunity to, to attend that, um, if data is your thing, if numbers are your thing, please you know, look into attending that particular event. Again, we have scholarship opportunities available to attend these conferences. Um, and lastly, we have our virtual Roma trainings. Um, those are being um, held um, in August. We have three, August 2nd, uh, 9th, and 16th. We have two spaces left for attendees. Um, and then again, we'll have three weeks in October for those virtual Roma trainings. So registration is still open for those. So please take a look at our website and you'll find the registration link for those. Um, and I did forget about Region 8. Uh, that is a virtual conference and that is being held this week. It starts tomorrow and will end on Thursday. Uh, Josiah, did I miss anything there? Awesome. Nope. That is all for me then. Thank you, Liz, and appreciate all those that have attended the regional forums and given us an evaluation, certainly, and look forward to seeing many more at the upcoming ones. Real quick note, I know our partners at Dola are going to spend some time talking about the community needs assessment and community action plan uh, that is culminating in the application being due in the grants portal on September 28th or 29th, uh, and Dola will uh, clarify that. Um, there is a requirement that a nationally certified ROMA trainer, or NCRT as it's known, uh, be involved in the processes locally. And so we really look at this as being involved in the needs assessment, providing some review on that specifically. Um, we are involved in the community action plan process annually by doing those projections that we do in the fall every year. Uh, you, you do that with a Roma certified trainer. So we are involved in the various uh, processes uh, regularly and how we plug into the needs assessment to really meet organizational standard 4.3 is have an NCRT review your needs assessment and provide feedback and uh, provide any um, any possible uh, suggestions or edits or things to look at. Um, so you can reach out to any NCRT uh, via email uh, at any time. We have a review template that we go through um, specifically around the needs assessment, make sure there's major pieces that need to be included in the needs assessment that we can clearly identify those. Um, also provide any other overall feedback we might have on the needs assessment. If you want that NCRT to review your mission statement and or your strategic plan um, and or your community action plan, the early drafts of it, you can also ask them to do that and provide them those materials. Uh, can easily do this process over email, so feel free to reach out to us. Uh, currently in Colorado at the state level, NCRTs, Alex Diaz with DOLA, uh, myself, and Liz uh, with the CCAA. So you can email any of us or all of us and one of us will take the time to go through that process with you. Um, and then um, with Douglas County, Rand Clark is also an NCRT. So Douglas County can do that internally. Um, if you're interested in supporting a local stakeholder becoming an NCRT and becoming an official Roma trainer with our national network, we also have support and guidance and technical assistance for that process. So reach out to us if you're interested in that. And then along the same lines, um, we are going to be doing uh, those 2024 projections uh, that we do every fall where we look forward to the upcoming program year and we project out what services or strategy and or strategies we're going to do and what outcomes we're hoping to obtain uh, and then at what levels we're hoping to obtain those outcomes. And this is a really important process in the Roma uh, cycle where we take a moment before the implementation of the plan to project out what our, our plan is going to be, what we're going to do, and what our success rates are going to be, and, and at what levels we hope to achieve success. 
Uh, we do this roughly every October, November, December. Um, we can really start doing this whenever you're ready. Again, you'll do this with an NCRT in the state. Uh, we have a spreadsheet where we go through all the things that you're looking at uh, conducting and, and putting in place in the upcoming program year, which again is calendar year 2024. Um, and we go through and then help you to identify what your projections are going to be. And just a big, big reminder that these are projections, right? We don't expect you to be 100% accurate in all these numbers, but again, is the best practice in the Roma cycle to project out what levels we're going to operate at and what levels of success we're going to see in our outcomes. You will have an opportunity in March after you finalize your 2023 data to revise these strategies and projections for 2024. So don't worry when we work on this in the fall, it won't be the last time you have an opportunity to make revisions, but we do like to get something documented and on paper before the start of the program year on January 1st. So as you're ready, please reach out to one of the NCRTs across the state and we can start um, getting you scheduled to meet with us and go through that. And I think it's also very helpful to start that process earlier if you um, are planning on having subrecipients involved in uh, your 2024 activities so that we can talk about how to reach out to your subs and uh, get their projections, because ultimately you're going to have to include their projections in your total projections. So with that, I'll take a moment to uh, breathe and see if there's any questions in the chat or if anybody has any questions, comments, I don't see any hands raised. Um, as uh, Liz and Jessica mentioned, we do have scholarships for training capacity building and also attending uh, various national and regional conferences. Please reach out to us if we can support you or your staff or your stakeholders, your tripartite board members in their professional development or their training and educational needs. Uh, and also for national certifications like the NCRT or to become a certified community action professional. So reach out to us for those. And lastly, we just wanted to get on your radar that um, OCS, our federal partners at the Office of Community Services who manage the Community Services Block Grant, our main program that we uh, work around, uh, have released a couple of NOFAs for a diaper distribution demonstration and research pilot. Uh, these NOFAs were um, uh, scaled down to about six to eight awards nationally, uh, and we didn't apply for them uh, because we didn't feel like we had a competitive application, neither uh, the capacity to really manage that type of uh, um, launch of a program at this point. But we do believe if there's a third NOFA that would likely come out in late 2023 that we would be a good applicant, and we are looking at potentially applying if that does become a reality. How we would likely structure this is to uh, work with you all uh, to identify appropriate diaper uh, pantries and the diaper dispensaries agencies that that help uh, get diapers to the appropriate households in your community and and work through you all to sub award uh, these uh, research and and uh, distribution funds too. So you all would be uh, likely a crucial uh, partner in this program. So we want to get it on your radar early. We'll of course communicate more with you if we hear that a, a third NOFA is coming out and we think we're going to apply. Uh, but we wanted to uh, at least give you the opportunity to look further into it and think about uh, if it does become a reality, how you might plug into your local partners that um, uh, work in the diaper delivery and distribution network locally and how we might partner with them. And with that, I'll uh, thank all the CCA staff for all the support and um, ask for any last questions or comments before I turn it over to our state partners. Thank you kindly, Josiah. If anybody has any questions, we'll address them as they come up here. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. I say that all the time. The CCAA is renowned throughout the nation for a reason, and Colorado has a reputation for incredible state association and state office relationship for very good reasons, and I appreciate you all very much. So you can see my slides, yeah? Fantastic. Um, all righty, so this should go pretty quickly here. I think the CCA touched on a lot of the things that we wanted to chat about as well. For federal fiscal year 2022, the spend down period end is rapidly approaching. Um, so for those federal fiscal year 2022 funds, please ensure that they're all spent down by September 30th, 2023. And then subsequently, of course, requested for reimbursement. We do have your spending plans and we've been actively working with a handful of entities to ensure that 
those funds can get spent down because the worst thing in my mind is for the funds to actually go back to the feds and not be used in the communities as intended. So that's absolutely my main goal. If you have any concerns about that or would like any support in strategizing around spend down the funds, please do reach out and let us know. Um, but just be aware that that is rapidly approaching. This first bit for me is all about the money. Um, federal fiscal year 2023's 1% allocation should be released by OCS to the state here in the next, uh, by the end of July, I believe. And so we will, of course, do our best to turn that around via option letter and get that added to your contracts within 30 days. It doesn't always happen, but we certainly do our best. And since this is a new contract cycle coming up, instead of just kind of adding that 1% to the next option letter, like we often do, in order to keep the separate contracts really clean, I'm gonna be sure to add that to the existing contract um, rather than kind of lumping it in with the next option letter. So even though it is a small amount, perhaps a couple hundred dollars for a lot of entities, we will be adding that to contracts here in the near future. So um, of course, we will let you know when that happens so that all subsequent documentation on request for reimbursement and contract totals can be updated accordingly. Just a an FYI that that 1% is headed our way before too long. For federal fiscal year 2024, um, this is just a note, nothing is sure and everything is in flux, but I did wanna just touch on uh, the upcoming funding for CSBG because I know a lot of folks have that on your minds, especially as the application for CSBG that uh, will be completed does ask for the projected funding amount. And so what, what we understand to be the case, as well as we know, is that the funding level for the next year is anticipated to be level, which is actually notable because a lot of human services programs in particular have had um, serious cuts, if not been eliminated completely. So the bipartisan support of CSBG continues and uh, we can anticipate tentatively similar funding levels coming up to what we have seen. So as you complete your application and some of these other things that ask for your budget, for example, when you need to pull a number, you can just use your federal fiscal year 2023 number with that additional 1% as the projected funding for the next year. So if that's at all unclear, you have any questions, of course, let us know. But uh, fingers crossed that that is at least the case for, for future funding. But of course, we won't know until the all of the bills and things have cleared. Uh, so I did want to make a note that we have recently updated our CSBG grantee resources page. The state of Colorado is committed to accessibility. And in that spirit, we are doing uh, overhauls of all of our digital materials and our websites and, and everything that the public has access to in order to, sh to ensure that everybody is able to access those things in a way that is equitable. So that means in practice that we have a handy dandy new CSBG website. So we will be sure to send this updated link. The old link should still go to this new website. It's just a matter of um, it's not the official home for it anymore. And Karen, Karen says that she loves the resource page updates. That's great. I also love some of them, Karen. And there are some that we are continuing to improve. So instead of two pages over here where you kind of have to click in, it's all on one page now, which is great and awesome. So this is the official CSBG page. Um, and it has a lot of the same information, of course, the calendar and upcoming dates information on previous allocations and contact information. And then this down here is what used to be its own link, its own web page, but now you have to click that little drop down now. And then that is the grantee resources page as it used to exist. We do still have property guidelines here, especially with links available. And those links are probably gonna be the most helpful things for folks because I mean, for me personally, this table, um, isn't necessarily the most useful format for that. So of course we want folks to be able to access it and we want it to be in a format that is, is practical for everybody. So we're gonna continue fine tuning that. Maybe just leave the links up so that 
folks can, um, you know, create your own tables and things. But everything else is still here. Of course, we pride ourselves on having a wealth of resources for everything CSVG related because there are so many CSVG related things. Uh, so anytime you have questions, the hope is you can come to this page and there are resources and templates and all kinds of things that you can use to um, get up to speed to do the things the many, many things that we all have to do for CSVG, and we appreciate that. So we are always trying to optimize this. So if you have suggestions for additional resources or feedback on the changes, as always welcome, please let us know. But just remember the big takeaway here is it's all on one page and this little drop down is the key to the CSVG kingdom for now. <laughs> um, already pressing on. We are continuing to do work on our biannual state plan. The state of Colorado is one of the states that does a CSVG plan that is submitted to the Office of Community Services every two years instead of every one year. So by September 1st, 2023, there will be a new CSVG state plan submitted for federal fiscal year 24 and federal fiscal year 25. Um, so we do We've sent out some of the old plan and you know garnered tried to garner feedback throughout the process because that's really important. And if any eligible entity has feedback, suggestions, or any kind of comments about how the state plan has been or should be, we very much want to know and we'll continue soliciting feedback. And the purpose of this meeting will be to present the draft uh, state plan for the upcoming submission for everybody's comments, questions, concerns, et cetera. And of course, we do very much welcome that. It is open to the public and it will be recorded. It is of course required that we also do that as well. So in addition to really wanting that feedback, it is, it is a requirement for us. So keep your eyes peeled. If you would really love to be deeply engaged in the development of the state plan, this is your opportunity and we welcome it. Because it is, it's an important driving force for how we manage CSBG in the state. And, um, you know, it's, it's not just a box checking exercise, but it really is in a way kind of our strategic plan. We encourage lots of folks to have plans and outcomes that you're driving toward and, and indicators along the way. And we try to do the same thing. So I am going to, in particular, make sure that this is a state plan that's not, not a copy and paste sort of thing, but it's going to be pretty well overhauled and it's going to really incorporate a lot of the, a lot of the themes and matters of importance that we've established over, over the years, like equity and training and technical assistance and really supporting everyone in things like the org standards to ensure that uh, those are a really helpful tool for everyone in our network. So please feel free to give us your feedback at that meeting or via phone, email, snail mail, it's all welcome. Um, and for the state plan, that should be going out here in the next couple of days as far as the invitation and the publication of it and everything. So you will be seeing that coming out here shortly and um, feel free to attend. It is completely optional, of course. We all know everybody has a lot to do, so it's not a required meeting by any means, but folks are encouraged to attend. Semi-annual reports are going to be due at the end of July, are due at the end of July, and uh, the, the primary purpose of those is to garner information about the tripartite board and compliance and that aspect of it. So if you have any questions or if you need support finding the template, it is on our CSBG grantee resources page, and of course you can always reach out to us for training or technical assistance around how to complete that. And the Office of Community Services, specifically Jessica Kane, our program specialist, was nice enough to reach out to us regarding the high temperature advisories that we've had and some of the extreme weather events that we've had. So we wanted to ensure that we're sharing resources around wildfires and extreme weather that OCS has given us. So it is going to be on these slides that get sent out after today's call. And um, it includes some things like the OCS disaster flexibility hubs, LIHEAP, um, disaster waivers and things like that, um, FEMA, ready.gov, SAMHSA, all kinds of things. So if anybody is experiencing that, please do take a look at these resources. And of course, you can always reach out to us and see if there's anything we can do to support or um, help in those situations. 
And then finally, I just wanted, Josiah did a great job of touching on a lot of the community needs assessment, community action plan, and three-year application. I did want to let everybody know that the application is now available in the grants portal. So you can start completing that at any time. Thank you, Becky and CCA for your help with that. Apologies for the delay. And the big takeaway for that for me is that the strategic plan is once again in the community or in the application in the CSVG grants portal. So the hope is not only will it be a really useful document for everybody and, and helpful in planning and strategy, and it'll also help check some boxes on the org standards. So by having that in the application, you don't have to do a separate strategic plan for CSBG necessarily, and it'll help to check a lot of those um, organizational standards boxes, and again, hopefully be a helpful tool. But uh, so that application is available in the grants portal. It is due September 29th, 2023. Again, the number to use when you're projecting your budget and everything is basically the same as federal fiscal year 2023. If you have questions about what that is, let us know. We may send that out here just as, as an FYI as well so that we're all on the same page. And that will also include the community needs assessment community action plan um, as uploaded documents as a part of that. And I just wanted to primarily remind everybody about the timeline for that because we are pretty much already there as far as when we think about approval deadlines and things. There is a form that we will send out after today's call. I believe it's also available in the portal and linked, um, but that is the chief elected official approval form basically. And so I'm gonna talk about the timeline working backwards a little bit because the application itself with all of those approvals and things is due September 29th. And so for that to be submitted, we need that form signed by basically your chief elected official after the board or tripart tripartite board or advisory committee has approved it. Um, so we have to get that official to sign the tripartite board or advisory committee to approve. And before that happens, a Roma trainer needs to review and provide you feedback about your community needs assessment. So um, when we think backwards about that timeline and getting kind of on the approval calendar for, you know, a board of county commissioners or governing board, we're, we're rapidly approaching um, the deadline here. So if anybody has support that they need or questions that you have, let us know. Um, I will have a community needs assessment that I need to review Roma style that I will get back to you, Heather, I see you. <laughs> so thanks for your patience. And um, we are looking forward to an influx of community needs assessments here in the next couple of weeks so that everybody's on that timeline to get that all done. So I just really wanna stress the importance of, of really keeping in mind all of the multiple steps that it's gonna take to get the, the application ready for that end of September deadline. So, um, and as part of our wrap up in the email today, I'll try to really clearly lay all that out just as a reminder and as a helpful sort of framework for folks to keep in mind as you're moving through your application process. Um, so that is the big one. Organizational standards in the THO system are now also available for completion. We've pulled final um, scores for the last year. And so you can basically now go in and update org standards that need to be updated and change statuses as needed, et cetera. And again, the hope is that that new community needs assessment, community action plan, strategic plan will all be taken into account as you're completing this year's org standards, which are due November 15th, 2023. So if you have uh, maybe new staff folks who don't have that login information or questions about that process, let us know. And of course, check out the CSBG grantee resources page for in-depth training and technical assistance on that. <laughs> And that's about it for now with a whopping six minutes to spare. Um, here's our contact information. Stephen ha asked if we have an update on the 200% FPL extension. Um, I'm gonna say, I do not have an update. Josiah, do you happen to have a kernel of knowledge that we don't that you could share with us? You know, I think our um, line that we're taking for that is that it's probably gonna go back to 125% on October 1st with the next continuing resolution, only because our main person in our network plugged into that kind of thing, David Bradley with the National Community Action Foundation has uh, repeatedly said over the last few months that it's a no-go in negotiations for the next continuing resolution. And um, as Alex mentioned, we're feeling very, very positive about the outlook for CSBG in the next federal budget. 
Um, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why that is, is because our lobbyist, David Bradley and NCAF is, is so great about positioning our program. So that's what we've heard. Um, I don't anticipate it changing until we hear from from David Bradley and, and NCAF or we see the continuing resolution that has 200%. So it's a great question, Stephen. Appreciate the question and a good reminder that you all should probably be planning on going to 125% on, on October 1st. So thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a good question. And correct me if I'm wrong, Josiah, but um, you know, I, I'm a lay person. Is it likely that I mean, it's not likely to be the same sort of back and forth that it has been, right? Like it might go back, but like it, previously, because we were on these continuing resolutions, it was it was kind of a given that the 200% could persist. Is that that? There was a change in Congress, anymore, right? right? And a change in the, you know, the party that runs the, the House, right? So now the Republicans are in the majority, uh, which has changed since the last continuing resolution. So that's a big piece of it. Um, the other big piece of it, I believe, is that um, there, again, I, I am inferring some things here, but I don't think that there's any um, appetite for making CSVG any target um, during the negotiations for the continuing resolution. So um, likely, if there's any uh, questions about it, it'll probably be punted, I'd, I'd imagine. Sorry for the sports analogy. <laughs> sure. And that's just to say we we have received feedback about how frustrating the back and forth was previously. And so I just want to let folks know that we're in a little bit of a different environment now. And it's it's potentially less likely to be that back and forth. And it could could really just be a change at this point. So whatever folks have to do programmatically to prepare for that, um, please do so and let us know if we can help. Did you have anything else to add on that, Josiah? Just that we've also heard, Alex, I think pretty clearly that the 200% FPL level is really beneficial and really has been impactful in Colorado across the network and you all being able to serve you know, your communities and your households. So it's not lost on us. It's something that we are prepared to you know, stand up for when appropriate. So that I wanted to highlight that as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I couldn't agree more. It's It's been a game changer for sure. <laughs> it's been nice. So there's that. Alrighty, I will I'll open the floor up for questions one last time before we adjourn with a whopping three minutes to spare. Thanks for that question, Stephen. That was a, a great, great topic to touch on. Alrighty, well, uh, again, if you can make the regional forums, please do so. They're a lot of fun. We're having a good old time out here. And thank you all for everything that you do. As you have questions, please let us know. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good day.